With an underhand shooting style, Rick Barry mastered the art of free throw shooting. Well, on this edition of Where Are They Now, brought to you by Pepsi, we talked to one of the absolute warrior icons, the Hall of Famer, Rick Barry, one of the 50 greatest players ever in NBA history. And Rick, when I go through your career, the numbers are incredible. When you think of someone scoring 25 a game and seven rebounds, nearly six assists, you weren't kind of the, the first point forward. You were a scorer, but you could rebound, you could pass, you could kind of do everything. How would you describe your game? Well, first of all, I want to apologize for my appearance because uh, I, I thought we were doing a, usually I do an interview with you, it's on the freaking radio. <laughs> so, uh, I, haven't, I haven't shaved, I'm getting here, you know, the gray's coming out, I'm getting old. But, you know, I look back and just feel how blessed I am to have had been given the natural ability uh, by God that was enhanced by the teachings of my father and my brother and coaches along the way. Learned a lot from teammates as well to have had a professional career. Uh, I wish I had been born a little bit later so I could have had those extra three zeros in my contract, but I wouldn't trade what I had in my lifetime involving basketball for anything. Uh, I feel that I was a player who was misunderstood probably in, in a lot of ways as far as people knowing me as a person. People have a perception of me that's very negative in some respects, which hurts my feelings. But then again, I know who I am and my friends know who I am. But I, I feel that if you owned a team, you want to have every player like me. And the reason I say that, Bob, is when I put my uniform on, you got everything I had. I'm going to give you everything I have representing you. You're paying me to play basketball. I, I kind of figure like that's a gift from heaven. I still shake my head in astonishment. When I first got my contract, even though they first offered me 12 5 and I was the second player picked in the draft. I negotiated with no agent up to 15 and got a $3,000 signing bonus. And Bob, I thought I, I was as happy as the pig in slop. I said, I couldn't believe I'm making $18,000 to play basketball. So it was actually paying me to do this because I, I love the game so much. I love playing so much. And one of the most difficult parts of my whole life was to have to stop playing when I was still capable of playing at 36. And to show you how things changed. Back then, I was ready to go from the, from the Rockets to the Boston Celtics, and they were going to sign me. But the league in 1980, to save money, cut the rosters from 12 to 11. Can you imagine? Now there's 17 guys that they have on their rosters. And so I never played again, and I had an operation that summer to clean out some some cartilage uh, issues that I had, and they found some calcium, some, uh, I don't know, a big thing of, of calcium, or whatever the heck it was back in there, that was wedged in my joint bigger than a silver dollar. And the doctor said, hey, Rick, how the heck did you play with this? And I said, well, I didn't know it was in there. And I hadn't felt that good in 10 years, Bob, and I never played again other than the tour when I went with with Bobby Dandridge and Pete Maravich and, and Phil Jackson, who was our player coach over to Asia. And we had a great time playing over there, but I, I hadn't felt that good in 10 years, but never played again. So the game's been great to me. It's been great to my family and I'll forever be a, a warrior. I mean, to win a world championship in the manner in which we did it uh, was something very, very special. <laughs> what was it about that team in terms of the playing two platoons and you mentioned the friendship of that team, you know, you and Clifford Ray and your relationship was so incredible, but it really was kind of a trendsetter. You know, you mentioned Washington won 60 games that year. The Warriors only, only won 48, and yet you sweep them for the championship. But, Rick, it, teams didn't play 10 guys and tag team guys in and out, like you mentioned, Cliff and George Johnson at the center spot. Did that start in training camp? Did that evolve as the season went on? What was the, the genesis behind that? Well, it was actually credit to Al to realize that he had an unusual team and that there really wasn't a lot of difference uh, between the players on the team as far as the talent and the ability for them to do things on the court. So he had to make a decision who he was going to put in the starting role. But we went deep and, and the guys didn't mind it. And they understood that if you play two minutes or you play 20 minutes or 40 minutes, it didn't matter. You're going to put the same effort forth. And we all were committed to defense. And probably the second greatest move that Al made, well, probably this would have been right up there, 1A and 1B, would be bringing in Bud Presley from Menlo Atherton College, Man Menlo Atherton College, who was, a, who was their basketball coach. And he came in and instilled 
a, a pride in us wanting to be a great team defensive team. And that's what it takes. It's not individual defense that wins championships for you. It's team defense. And he, he just instilled this amazing stuff. I still remember it so vivid to me seeing one time he got up, he was a chain smoker, a little overweight and stuff. And he told Clifford Ray to get up. And Clifford at that time was, you know, like a, like, like a rock. I mean, he maybe had three, 4% body fat. And he told him to back, he said, no, back up a little further. Look, he said, okay, start running. He said, no, run at me. So Clifford takes off and starts running. And he jumps in front of Clifford and Clifford knocks him back. He does a couple of somersaults. I thought he, I thought he really hurt him. And he's laying on the ground. He says, now that's what I'm talking about. You got to put your body out there. You got to be willing to sacrifice. <laughs> and I, I mean, it's so vivid in my mind seeing that. And he just instilled this incredible pride that we took in our defense of working together, understanding what team defense is all about, not giving up easy baskets. We weren't the biggest team in the world. I mean, Clifford Ray, 6'9", right? Jamal, uh, Keith at the time, six foot, what, five, six, maybe. I'm six, seven and a half. I mean, and Clifford, I mean, Jamal, I, I can't, I'm going to keep calling him Jamal, even though you know he was Keith. And Jamal, you know, he's a skinny guy. I was a skinny guy. I mean, seriously, we weren't a really big team, but we were the best rebounding teams in the league because we took such pride in what we did defensively. And very rarely did a guy not get challenged. And it, it was such a special group of guys in the way that we worked hard together. And I knew there was something special about this when we went to training camp over in Hawaii. And Clifford, of course, was, I think, the, the, the missing ingredient that we had. Uh, everybody thought we'd be not even – a playoff team. That's why I say it's the biggest upset, upset in the history of professional sports and the three major ones. Nobody picked us to even be a playoff team. And not only do we win our Western, West, you know, our division, our Pacific division, and win the, win the Western Conference, we sweep the team that's supposed to sweep us in what was supposed to be the biggest mismatch in finals history in the NBA. So that's what made it even more special. But when we went over to Hawaii, we just kind of bonded together. We kind of knew there was something special. Now, honestly, did I think that we would be a world championship team? No. But I certainly felt that we were going to be a playoff team. And as the season progressed, I got thinking more and more, and I got more and more convinced in my own mind. I said, we, this, we got something really special going here. And we're going to surprise a lot of people. And that's what we were able to do. And we started playing some really good basketball later in the season. We started the season off well, which was a, a good thing for us. And it was just a special group of people. It's just very, very special. So, uh, yeah, and most teams only went maybe seven, maybe eight deep. And so I was willing to go down as far as he had to go because the difference between the guy coming off the bench who was 9, 10, 11 on the roster, whatever, he, was, he had the chance to play as well or better than the guy that he was replacing. That's just the way it kind of worked for us, and, and it worked exceptionally well. Now, when you look at the Rick Barry resume, the underhand free throw is always going to be part of your legacy. To shoot 90%, to be among the best free throws ever in the history of the game, with such an unusual style. And you even taught George Johnson that championship year, and he raised his free throwing almost 25%. Give, give people an idea of the, the background there and why you were so proficient and, and why other players just haven't gravitated to what is an incredible way to, to make free throws. Bob, I, I don't have the answer to that. I, I mean, people ask me that all the time. I just don't understand why people let their egos get in the way. I mean, the, the object of shooting free throws is the only part of the game where you're totally on your own, could be totally selfish. No one's trying to stop you from doing what you're doing offensively. Right. Same distance every time. Same size basket every time. Same size ball every time. The object is to get the ball in the basket with the highest percentage possible. Right. And in recent years, and they've done studies, and the physicists have done studies and said it is without question the most efficient way and the best way to actually shoot the basketball to make a free throw. And yet you still can't get people to want to try to do it. I had one guy, I won't mention his name, who was one of the players on one of the, one of the teams when I was broadcasting, who reached out to me and asked me to do it. He came, he visited me where I was living in Colorado. And I worked with him. I actually had my younger son, Canyon, who shoots underhanded, who's the only one of my boys that actually decided to do it for his career. Scooter could do it well, but he said, Dad, it's hard enough being your son without shooting underhanded free throws. I said, son, that may be true. I said, but if you could shoot a higher percentage shooting underhanded, you're doing yourself and your team a disservice. So, and Brent at one time did it and had, I think, the highest percentage of his whole career when he was at Oregon State. And for whatever reason, he got mad at me or something. He decided to go back overhand. I never <laughs> said anything to the guys because they were all really good free throws. They're up in the 80s. So if you're in the 80s, you're good, okay? I'm not going to try to do anything. 
But if you have great pride and you really care about what you do, even Mike Newland, who I, who I really like so much, what a great person Mike is and a heck of a player. He wanted to get me to teach him to do it when I was at the Rock. I said, Mike, you're an 88% free throw shooter. You don't need to be changing right now. <laughs> he said, but I think I can shoot a higher percentage your way. And so that was the kind of attitude you, you would hope that you would get from a lot of other people. And my son, Kenya, has gotten up as high as 90% and you know, set a record at Florida for the most consecutive free throws made in competition and, and still shoots a very high percentage and is playing now. Now, when we say Rick Barry's a scorer, we got to put it in perspective because you're the only man to lead the NCA, the ABA, and the NBA in scoring, average 40 in the finals in 1967, get 64 in a game in 1974, all without the three-point line. I mean, how are you scoring 64 points against Portland that night without a three-point line, Rick? I mean, and tell people that maybe didn't see you live how you put up points that way. Why were you such a great prolific scorer, do you think? It's really easy, Bob. You take enough shots, you can score points. <laughs> so, no, seriously, I, I was taught how to play the game by my dad who was a semi-pro player. He said, son, when you get the ball, you have to be aggressive offensively and you have to find a way to see if you can get a basket and score, provided one thing, you don't have a teammate in a better position because if you do, he gets the ball. So that's playing aggressively, but not playing selfishly. When pro teams, you look at a team, if they're shooting 80% or better as a team, you're gonna win a fairly significant number of extra games during the course of the season because games, a lot of games are decided by one, two, three, and four points. And that difference between shooting 68 or 70% from the line and 80% from the line is enough to make up that difference and win games. Well, I mean, you hit on it perfectly. I mean, the Warriors Steph Curry championship, they were the best free throwing team in the league. And obviously Steph is challenging you and Mark Price for maybe being the greatest free thrower ever. When you watch and think of your championship team, what do you think when you're watching the current dynasty warrior championship team? Because I always love your perspective for someone who was such an elite player, but also appreciated the, the, the changes in the game and the way this edition of the Warriors had played. Give me kind of your thoughts watching those three titles. You were brought back a number of times and were around the team quite a bit. What do you think of the three warrior recent championships? Well, I love watching that team play, um, but they weren't playing the game the way the golf game had evolved. They actually were playing the game the way it was supposed to be played yeah. with one element. They had the three point shot and they were incredibly proficient at the three point shot, which changed the entire dynamic of why they were able to be so successful. But the one thing about what the Warriors have done with, with Steph and Clay and then adding KD to the mix, they changed the dynamic of the game. They changed the way the game was approached to being played and defended. For decades and decades and decades, the deal is, is that if you do three things, you have a chance to win games. Stop a team from getting easy baskets on second chance points, on fast break opportunities, and getting to the basket. So, and here's the philosophy. Make them beat you from the perimeter. Well, folks, with that warrior team, not only could they beat you from the perimeter, they could embarrass you from the perimeter. And that's what changed everything. Because early on when they first got the three point shot in, and you know, I only got to be a decent three point shooter, but if I were playing, I wouldn't be happy if I wasn't a 40% three point shooter, if I were playing today. I would work at it to the point that I'd be 40% or better. That would be my, my goal, just like in free throws. It wasn't 80 for me, I wanted to be 90, okay? So if you're a 33% three-point shooter, you're a 50% two-point shooter. So that's very good. So anything from 30 to 33 or four, that's, that's good shooting. It's okay shooting. But man, you start getting up in the high 30s and get to 40 and stuff, that's special. And the Warriors had three guys that were capable of doing that. And so when you play the Warriors, it was a situation, okay, you hope that they decide to not really play their brand of basketball, pass, move, and cut. And you hope that two of those three guys are having bad shooting nights from three-point right. range. The individual accomplishments, accomplishments are incredible. And that's why you're always in the conversations, one of the greatest small forwards ever. Yet in every interview I ever see with you, you talk about your 74, 75 championship ring as one of your most prized possessions. And it, it's an emotional side of you that you don't show all that often. And I tell people championships are forever. And I, I point to you a lot. Rick Barry talks with such great pride and such great camaraderie and friendship for that championship. And the ring to me is what symbolizes all that for you. You always 
reference it, talk about it, and how important it is to you. And I, I think it shows a side of you that not a lot of people get to see very often. Well, I mean, why do you play? I mean, some guys, maybe they play for the money. I, I didn't play for the money because I wasn't making that much. But I mean, yeah, I, I played to be a champion. And so the other things, here's how I equate it. If you take, when you look at a cake, a, a cake for a birthday, anniversary, whatever. So they've got candles, they've got all kinds of icing, fancy decorations, cherries, all this other stuff. So that's kind of like being elected to the Hall of Fame, uh, winning a scoring title, winning a free throw title, uh, winning uh, Steele's title, uh, making, you know, making the all-star game, uh, being first team all pro, all of those things. Those are all the decorations. How do they look sitting on a plate with no cake? <laughs> okay. I mean, seriously, it's like a big like mess, it. right? So you got to have the cake in order for the other things to make. And the cake is the championship and that's the championship ring. And you play for the championship. That's what's meaningful. The other things are just the adornments to the cake. Now, that's, that's a great analogy. Did, did in, in 67, in losing the finals, did that motivate you in 74, 75 when you got to the finals and said, I, I got to make sure I get my championship? I know that when you talk to Jerry West, he talks about all the finals where his team wasn't good enough. They finally won that one championship. Did, did losing once in the finals kind of really, you know, make sure in 74, 75 you wanted to take advantage of that great team and that great opportunity? Yeah, well, I mean, people didn't think we were a great team, but certainly uh, the greatest way to learn how to do something right is to do it wrong. It's not its not giving to credit to anybody, but it's just a great statement. You, you learn for your mistakes. One of the things that I learned most of anything else is that you can't get yourself so emotionally worked up because actually it drains your energy. Hmm. When you're so pumped up and so geeked, as they like to say, it's taken energy out of you. And so you gotta be careful. You have to conserve your energy. And so I learned not to allow that to happen, but it also was the biggest disappointment. One of the biggest disappointments of my career, certainly on the professional level was the biggest disappointment because I played to win. Here I am in my second year. I led the league in scoring. I was the MVP of the all-star game. And I still was so disappointed because we didn't win the championship. I didn't play to be the MVP of the All-Star game. I didn't play to be first team all pro. I didn't play to lead the league in scoring. I played to win a championship. And we came up, two plays, trick and rolls with Nate Thurman and myself, God rest his soul, my dear friend, with Will Chamberlain. And had those plays gone our way instead of theirs ways, we win in six games and not them. And the thing that was probably most disappointing to me is that even though I had the record for a long, long, long time until Michael broke it, as far as the number of points scored in an NBA Finals in a six-game series. But he did play three overtimes and got 10 points in those overtimes and beat me by one point. <laughs> uh, I played that entire series having to get my ankle shot up before the game and at halftime. Today, they probably, I would never, they would never have allowed me to have done it. But I could have ruined my entire career. I was so lucky that I didn't do something severely to damage my ankle for the rest of my life. Uh, because, I mean, come on, I got shot before the game and at halftime, couldn't feel my ankle and played an average 40 points a game. So I'm thinking, what the hell could I have done if I was really healthy? I never got to practice. My shooting was down some, I couldn't practice. And you know, I remember Coach Sharman, you know, he was not happy with me. I said, well, I said, come on. I said, yeah, I mean, it's crazy enough that I'm getting shot up to play. I said, you'd be happy, I'm willing to do that. I said, I'm not gonna get shot up just to go shoot around. I would want to get my ankle some rest. So yeah, it was, it was kind of interesting, but uh, I learned, there's no question about it, but again, it still came down to a situation where without my teammates, we don't do it. One person can't win. I mean, it doesn't matter any team sport, you can't win only because of one person. It just doesn't work. You can have a pitcher who's pitching the greatest game of his life. If he doesn't have people backing him up, making the plays for him behind him, and they make some errors and stuff, he could lose. So it takes a team effort. And then somebody's got to hit the ball a few times to try to either you know drive in at least one run if you're shutting them out. Right. So it's, it's, that's the beauty of team sports is team sports is so much more rewarding as far as I'm concerned, having played golf, which is an individual sport and tennis, which is an individual sport. Who do you share that with? Oh yeah. You have a coach and you have your friends and your family who are supporting you, but they're not out there in the trenches with you. That's why it's so special. And I'm so appreciative of the warriors bringing guys us back together at different times to be able to be there because it's such a great reunion because we had something so special that we shared it that is a part of our lives that we'll never forget. 
And so it's it's a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm hoping that the guys that are still around now that will all be around and someday that we'll all be healthy enough to come back for that 50th anniversary of that 75 championship. That would be a really cool thing. You mentioned tennis and golf a little bit. And I know when Jim Barnett ever talks about Rick Barry, he's like, Bob, you wouldn't believe the athlete this guy was. You want to run? Fine. You want to play golf? Fine. You want to play tennis? Fine. No matter what he did, he was just natural at it. And the long drive championship, to me, in 2005, I mean, to see you finish second, how did you get into long driving golf balls and just make that a pursuit that you excelled in? Well, I, 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 ran, in, I ran into somebody, Brad Peterson was the young man's name when I was in Vegas at one of the retired players uh, meetings down in Las Vegas. I was, I've been on the board a lot of times there. And I heard them talking about golf and I said, what are you guys talking about? And then I heard that he had done some stuff in long drive and he had this new different way to, to swing the golf club. And so I actually went, I said, well, what is that? He said, so we went out to the driving range over there in South Las Vegas that night and he showed me what he was doing and I picked it up pretty quickly. And so I kind of trained with him and he said, well, you know, you can get into doing stuff. So I actually went through the process. And when I was back in, in, in Colorado where I was, I went to a tournament that they had, an event uh, outside of Denver and went over there and joined it and competed using a swing and stuff. And I won that event, which qualified me to be able to go to the World Long Driving Championship and they had different age groups. And I went down there and I did it and I wound up, you know, I wound up, see, I think I lost, I was in the seniors division and I had the longest drive and just before they had all artificial surfaces, it was on the, on the mud and it rained all day and everybody calls me, Rick, you got to go, you're going to win. I said, what do you mean? You see, yeah, well, the guy's got his last swing up there and everything and you know, you got the longest drive. I mean, so I started walking back over there with my clubs and what have you. I said, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. And he hits a shot. My ball hit and plugged because it was all wet. His ball hits short of mine and rolls past me and beats me on the last swing of the competition. So that kind of gave me more incentive to want to do it. So I went back and did it the next year. And so I actually wound up winning four different world long driving championships in the different age divisions. But the thing, reason I did it is that the one thing I missed most, I love missing, I missed playing and, and without, without question and the, and the competition, but it was the adrenaline rush that I got, the butterflies in the stomach before I go out to compete, knowing that you're putting yourself out there for possible failure in front of people. It's just a feeling that you're really hard to describe. And I miss that as much as I miss the playing itself. And so I, that's what I missed. And, it, and I got that back and I loved doing it until they got to the point where they started, they eliminated the, the old farts division. And so I couldn't compete anymore. So it was cool. But now I have fly fishing because that's an art form. I don't get the same adrenaline. I'm not competing to do it. Just competing against myself to try to hook a hundred or more fish every day I go out up in Alaska. And, um, and so I love that because it's an art form and I take great pride in everything that I do. And that's what I try to instill in my children. And that's what I try to instill in young people when I talk to them is that you must have pride in what you're doing and the good pride, the pride that, that means that you're going to give your best effort every time you step out there and never be satisfied uh, with what you do, learn by the mistakes you make. But in the same, same vein, you can't be afraid to make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. You're going to make mistakes. And that's how you learn. And if you're intelligent, you learn by the mistakes that you make and you just minimize the mistakes that you make and you're going to have a chance to win because every sport, and I was with people the other day talking about this, I don't care what it is, every game is a game of mistakes. There are a lot of mistakes made in every athletic contest, and the team that makes the fewest mistakes is generally the team that wins. Give me a thought as we wrap it up on the Bay Area and that relationship with the 74-75 team, and that, you know, every time there is a reunion, that, that team is so, you know, held in great regard and, and looked upon so fondly by Dub Nation, and it, it, it's Bill King and Franklin Muley and yourself, and you know, hey, it's it's the Hopper, Charles. You know, oh, it's it's George Johnson, Cliff Ray. It it's was so Phil great. Smith and Keith. That, that you know now Jamal Wilkes. And that team still reverberates. People still talk about it. it you know, the incredible seven game series against Chicago. You said, you know, rightly so, the improbable sweep of this sixty win Washington team. Why why do you think there's that connection? Why is that team so special? Well, fortunately, because a lot of the people who still feel that way are still alive because they're a lot older now. Uh, that's always the number one thing, and God bless them for that. But I think it's because the people can relate to us because we just went out there. We were like bringing our, bringing our lunch buckets and putting our hard hats on there and getting the job done. And they knew that we put everything we had into it, and we gave a great effort, and we cared. And, and I think that resonated with, with our fans. That's one of the reasons that the Bay Area fans are so terrific. They really do appreciate that. And I'm just so grateful that, that Joe Lakeup came along to do what he did. And Peter, 
to put the money behind what needed to be done and bring in the right people to make the right decisions about the personnel because in team sports is three things for success who do you draft who do you get in free agency who do you trade for it's about the players and then you hope you get a coach that doesn't screw things up but without the players and the right personnel you're never going to win in a team sport and so they did a great job of bringing quality people and people who knew how to play the game the right way who are willing to play the game unselfishly and it's been a joy it was a joy for me to watch them it's always great to talk basketball uh, again fond memories with uh, with with the warriors just uh, I'm proud to have been a warrior um, you know, still even have have a shirt on here showing it right here. Let me show you there. I got my thing right here. Stay gold, whatever it may be. Stay together. You know, I, I just and we had on our ring. The word we put on our ring was togetherness. That was the word we chose to put on our championship ring, and that's what it was. We were we were all together in one goal, which was to try to be the best in the world, and we were for that one season, and uh, it was it was pretty special. Thanks for joining us, Rick. The incomparable Rick Barry on Where Are They Now? Brought to you by Pepsi. I could talk basketball with you forever. It's an amazing journey. And I think uh, I think people appreciate more of Rick Barry and more of your accomplishments and more of what you've done as time passes, Rick, because the numbers, you know, they don't lie. The appreciation for it and that 74, 75 team, like you said, that will live forever. Well, Certainly, I've learned more things recently about that I did that I didn't even know because I tell you what, I never paid any. I played. I showed up. I put my uniform on and I played. More things have come up, even in the documentary, talking about you know Michael. My name popped up for certain things, and then people are sending me all these things about this and this record and that record and that record that I'm involved in that I had no idea because I didn't play for records. I played to win, and I didn't go out there to make friends. When I played, and Clifford Ray said, "Well, you did a good job of that." B, he calls me B. <laughs> <laughs> because the year that we won the championship, they changed the voting for the MVP of the league, and gave it to the players. I mean, come on, the players are going to take things personal. I was the only unanimous choice first team All Pro by the writers, and came in third or fourth, I think, in the MVP voting for the league. So, I mean, it just shows you how things go. I mean, the big thing is. Yeah, okay, so maybe I would have got another ring or an award and everything, but I have my championship ring, and that's all that really matters. Rick, thanks so much for taking the time. Always good seeing you. Always good talking to you. I look forward to seeing you again, and hopefully in the arena, you know, in the yeah. center, without, you know, with fans. That would be nice. Hopefully it'll all be back to normal next season. Sounds good. Rick, take care. Be good. Right. God bless you and the listeners and the watchers.